I'm going to introduce our panel of illustrious um, reviewers. I'll start with Sama Abdurakib. She is the associate director um, at the Maine Humanities Council. She is a poet, uh, just wrote a, published her first chapbook, Each Day is Like an Anchor. And I got to hear a, a poem that you recited, was that a couple of weeks ago, November 7th, 2020? That was, that was really sweet. Um, and um, Samaya lives in Brunswick with her cat, Stashel Hammett. She enjoys birding, hiking, and being outdoors and coaching leaders of color. She's an outdoor Afro leader in Portland, Maine, and has been connecting with Black people in the outdoors for over three years. And she has written and reviewed many grants, both elsewhere and for us here. Nat May is the program officer at the Onion Foundation. He is also the um, a founding board member of Common Field and the Hewn Oaks Artist Colony and was the first executive director of Space Gallery in Portland, Maine. He established the Kindling Fund, it goes on and on. Um, he has worked or advised numerous local and national arts organizations such as the National Endowment for the Arts, Creative Capital, Americans for the Arts, the Alliance of Artist Communities, Portland Museum of Art, Maine College of Art and Indigo Arts Alliance. And Sarah Trunzo is a musical artist and organizational consultant, singer songwriter, food system organizer extraordinaire. Um, toured nationally and worked in Nashville, but always returns home to Maine, Waldo County, go. Latest record, Cabin Fever Dream, appeared on both folk and Americana radio charts. Co-founder of Veggies for All and Waldo County Bounty, which are rural Maine food security organizations. She um, provides consulting services take note fundraising grant writing and storytelling and is a former advisor of the Waldo County Committee of the Maine Community Foundation. So we have some questions that we collected from you all um, when you signed up for this and so we're going to start in with those and if anything comes to mind throw it in the chat some of the, I do want to say that some of your questions will be answered elsewhere um, in the workshops that are coming up. Um, we will put that link in at the end. And um, I also mailed that to you um, earlier today. Martha? Yes. You want the poll results. Did the poll happen? The poll happened. Cool. It was magic. Because <laughs> I don't uh, have a record of that. Sure. The question, have you ever written a grant before? 88% of our participants tonight say yes. And if you have, were you successful? A whopping 69% of you say yes. So that's wonderful. Great. So we have some people who are fresh to this work and a lot of successful grant writers. That's fantastic. So actually, I just wanted to say a little bit about our process here at the Maine Arts Commission around, around grants. We, um, we've, this, is, this webinar is about the grants that you could apply for through the Maine Arts Commission for arts-related grants. And all of our panel have a whole breadth of experience elsewhere as well as with us that they will be bringing to bear in their in their in their discussion today. We receive hundreds of applications during our busy grant season this spring. We received hundreds in the fall for the ARPA grants. Um, we enlist people in the arts and culture community, like our panel here, um, to be on our review panels. We do have a sign up. If anyone is interested, we have a sign up on our website, and maybe David can put that in the chat. We try to have three reviewers per panel, um, and they read about 30 applications. We try for a diversity 
around a number of characteristics, geography, arts discipline, um, what communities they might be representing, grants experience, et cetera. So each panel reads them all, scores them all, records comments, and then meets together and share the comments as a group. And sometimes as a result of that discussion, their scores and comments change. The panels are all now held on Zoom and the recordings are made available to applicants afterwards. So I've, I'm gonna try to not talk very much anymore. It's really, I want you all to answer. So starting right in, Samet, what to you is the most important element in a successful grant proposal? What's your first personal criteria? Thanks, uh, Martha, and thanks for having me on this panel. Um, I actually really love reading grant applications. So for me, I, I really am particularly moved by the, by the narrative um, and by, I can never pick one thing. So by the, um, by the, the way that the proposed project or the organization, if it's a general operating support is trying to respond to the needs of the communities that they're serving, that they're serving. I also get really excited if, if the grant um, is, um, if there's collaboration with the communities that, that the organization or that the project is serving. Um, so, you know, when I'm looking at a grant application, I tend to check out the mission, look at the narrative before I look at the budget, you know, before I look at a timeline or anything like that. Um, those are the, 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 that's what I find most compelling. Yeah. I also can't pick just one thing, <laughs> but I think generally like, the there needs to be a clarity throughout the entire proposal um where like what's being said in the narrative maps perfectly onto what's being said in the budget maps perfectly with whatever the um supplemental materials are and ma that all maps with where there's a community need or why your project is special and compelling and why it's the right time to do it so like that clarity, I mean, very important and probably something you could all guess and also kind of like the boring part, but it needs to, it's the foundation. Um, and I, I think that like hearing, um, you know, what also needs to be present is something that's that's interesting, exciting, that the, the writer is passionate about and that you can have that feel. So the first part's kind of more technical to me and the the other quality is like, it's a feel thing. Like, you know, when somebody's excited about their thing, their book of poetry, their interpretive dance series or whatever, you know. Um, I will say specific to Maine Arts Commission grants, something that I was surprised in this last round of reviews was to have the supplemental materials in some cases be kind of like lighter. And that's one area where for Maine Arts Commission specifically, they allow you to share so many, um, so many videos, audio, flyers from your last successful event. And it's really compelling as a reviewer to see that because like I, there's no, as somebody that's not interest, that's not, uh, that doesn't know much about interpretive dance. It's like, you got to show me the video or I don't, I can't get excited with you. So having that, having that multimedia piece um, really helps pop you to the top of the list in my in my book. Matt, um, I, I agree with um, what Samat and Sarah have said, but I'm going to lower the bar even a little bit and just say I want a clear picture of what you're trying to do. I want to be able to close my eyes after I've read the narrative and imagine whatever you hope will be happening. And it sounds so obvious, but I would say there's a there's a healthy portion of grants that I've read that are abstract or they just lack like kind of specific details. And I and I can't fill it in. And I, you know, I've 
spent the last 20 years in Maine attending all kinds of arts events uh, in all the disciplines and all the formats with all the scales of size. So I have a pretty good imagination of what's possible. And so it's troubling to me sometimes when I'm reading something and I just don't quite get what they're going for. Mm -hmm. Can I just, I think, uh, oh. You go, go ahead and then I'll go. <laughs> I, you know, Sarah, when you mentioned the supplemental material, I was, so, you know, uh, I, yeah, I've read grants for many different kinds of funders and the most, I think the most joyful thing about reading Maine Arts Commission grants is the supplemental materials. And so, um, Sarah, what you said about don't be scant on supplemental materials. Yes, pretty, I, I'm not a, <laughs> I am not a, I have, I'm not a visual reader. Like I don't create an image in my head. And so whatever the supplemental materials are, yes, yes, very helpful. I think for me, that's where the clarity piece, like I feel like I have read grants that are, um, maybe the narrative isn't clear. And then there's a, there's a lot of supplemental material that they're hoping, well, I don't know what the hope is, but you know, that, that, takes the place, maybe takes the place of the clarity of the narrative. And that does not work for me. Like there has to be there, you know, like it, 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 it can't be like, I'm, my words are really vague, but look at this fantastic uh, interpretive dance piece, you know, cause I'm often like, I does that actually connect to the thing that I just read? And so for me, that's where that clarity comes, comes in. Totally. Yeah, and, and what I was going to say is that sometimes it's something as simple as to achieve what Nat was talking about as having a proofreader who does not know about your thing. They're not like your collaborator that's also super excited about your art exhibition and they, their brain is in it already. But like to have somebody that's a really fresh set of eyes that's like doesn't have the background, doesn't have the expertise, they don't know, you know, about what you're trying to achieve personally with your art um, or your organization. So having that, that really fresh set of eyes that will make you go to a place that sometimes could feel, I think, too like elementary or maybe reductive, but is very helpful. The, the, the reason I'm asking for the money is X, you know, X number of dollars will go to Y. Like sometimes it seems like, man, don't you want more beautiful, expressive? And it's like, no, <laughs> no, like really that as clear as possible, as simple as possible, sometimes really gets the job done. Yeah, I was just to add, I've been advising some folks lately to think about what you might put on, a, on an event listing or on a flyer, if you remember putting up flyers around town, like, you know, we're going to sell tickets or it's going to take place at this time in this place. Like, those are the kinds of details I think people get too caught up in their own headspace when they're writing the grant and they forget to say those kinds of basic things. And so that's where we can't fill in. And there's such a range of ways of doing things. You know, if you say that you offer classes, you need to you need to say, you know, what ages you're offering them to or whether you charge tuition or not. Because some people do and some people don't. And it's not necessarily when we're reading that there's a judgment on how you do it, but we might not understand your stance of, of how you're how you're choosing to um, make the thing happen. Okay, that could go on and on, couldn't it? So here's a question for you, um, which may not have a, a clear answer. So, um, so what's more important, merit, uh, showing a proven track record, or need, addressing something new? Sarah, you start. I I don't think that that is a that there's a clear answer to that one. And I think in the specific um, case of Maine Arts Commission, where there's like a, a panel of peers really uh, reviewing um, the application, um, different types of applications are gonna speak to different re reviewers. And as long as you're checking all the boxes of like, this has a clear budget, it has a clear narrative, there's some kind of need being demonstrated. You know, as long as the basics are fulfilled, anything above and beyond that, wow, this person has a really unbelievable history of work, or 
wow, this person is really fresh and they're striking out in this really raw, brave way. Um, some of that's going to be up to the, to the discretion of the individual reviewer. And that's why it's, I, well, that's why there's, I, I feel some relief as a reviewer that I know my scores are going to be batched with other reviewers. And some of them will feel exactly the same way I do. And some of them, um, there's a little bit of that subjectivity and it kind of, I think, I, I hope comes out in the wash um, through the process. And I will say before it sounded like I was like, had this, like this beautiful process and I am a trust the process person, but I want to tell you all that I had multiple grants um, in the application pool, obviously not ones that I was reviewing, but in the ARPA pools for organizations I was representing and for myself individually as an artist and I didn't get any funding this time. So it really is like, it's very unpredictable, even if you kind of like know the rules of the road. Matt, you want to jump in? Yeah, I think um, what I'm looking for is I want to believe that the applicant can do what they what they're proposing, and so it, it's not always necessary that they've done that thing before. Sometimes it's exciting if they haven't done that thing before, but I'm looking for some supporting evidence, I guess, that um, there's a there's a, a some kind of like lead up to doing that thing, or I might be looking for reasons that they've thought about the context that they're working in um, and that it's a, it's a smart decision about how they wanna do the thing. So I often supplement my grant reading with uh, research into, if it's an organization, I'll look at their website and try to figure out how are they signaling what they do to the community they're working with. Um, or if I was a if I was a member of their community, how would I access their programs? And does that align with the way they're talking about um, how they want to work? And sometimes people um, are trying a new thing and they'll acknowledge in the application, we haven't done this yet and here's where we're going. That is really clarifying. But if you say that you do a thing and you want support to do a thing, but then you haven't done it before and you and you and there's no there's no proof of concept. It gets it gets hard for the um, reader, I think, to believe or to have a lot of faith in what you're doing, as compared to maybe a bunch of other grants that are like a little bit easier to follow along. Um, and then in terms of uh, individual artists, it's, it's kind of the same thing. I think it's really exciting to support artists trying new directions and making new things and experimenting. But you wanna you wanna feel like there's some kind of history that has gotten them to the point where they're taking that next step. Yeah, I, um, right. I, I don't think that's a, it's not an easy question. I, I, um, I really like applications that are trying something new. Uh, if, yeah, as Nat says, if it's, if the, if the new, if the new thing that they're trying seems well thought out and feasible, and I feel like, um, or, you know, uh, new relationships that they're trying to forge through the through the work. I mean, I, I just um, if it seems like if it seems like it's a if it just seems like it's not actually viable or not um, well planned out or well thought out, then then I just lose I just lose faith in the project. Um, the proven track record. For me, that one, it, 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 it depends. Um, I think either can be compelling. I think if, um, if it's an organization or, or, or if, it's a, if it's a project that is responding to a particular need in the community or, um, and that need persists, then I tend to be more, more swayed by that. Um, yeah. Over there. Any follow up from anybody? Okay, so you, you mentioned budget. So we do just so people know we do have another webinar that's only about budget, you should absolutely go to that one. But I'm going to throw this question out here for you. Um, and that you want if you want to start so does a thoroughly detailed budget 
strengthen a proposal? Um, I think there's a good a good um, middle ground where you don't want it to be um, too too abstracted, where you don't really understand. Like, I'm interested in how artists get paid, right? So if you if you say that you're doing a project and your budget is this big number to pay the artists, but you're not explaining how people how individuals get paid or how you're valuing their time, that's maybe not enough detail to help me be excited about what you're trying to do. Um, but I also like I've seen grant applications that give me four pages of materials, like down to the how much the markers gonna, are going to cost and how much the, you know, all of the different things are. And no, nobody needs that. Um, we'll we can have faith in in your shopping ability. Right. So I think, um, you know, I think the, the way the Arts Commission has the grant form, um, it's a pretty good level of detail. You might want to add a, a little bit. Um, and I, I think you don't have to be bound by the categories that are there and you don't have to fill in each of those categories if they're not applicable. So when I, I, I mentioned about how I like did not get funding and like maybe many of you, um, I went back to look at the review video and even though I knew the result of it, I still was like, for some reason, my heart was in my throat because people are going to be like on the video talking about my application and my whether my artwork has merit and, you know, um, just kind of like funny that I could still be that nervous about it. But but the point of all that is to say um, I took as a huge compliment <laughs> when the reviewers were looking at my budget, they said, no questions. Now let's like talk about the materials. And and I really think like that is distilled how you want a reviewer to feel about your budget. Like, no questions, makes sense. Like not, what is this weird thing? And is that in kind or is it a cash gift? Or like, are they paying themselves but they're not gonna pay the audio technicians and the video technicians? And just like, this is another example where having somebody that is not in your absolute most inner circle, taking a look at it and being like, you know, just to kind of check your homework kind of attitude. If the, if you feel like a reviewer could have no comments on it, that's good. Yeah, I like a clear budget, It does that, which does not necessarily mean a detailed budget. And I like a budget that, that, um, that feels equitable in the context. Um, and so I, you know, I think like what, what Nat was just saying about like paying, paying artists. So, you know, those are, I, I look at that and, and, um, and if it's, and if it seem, you know, so I, I look at that and I try to, and I, that sways me one way or the other way, but mostly I just look for, mostly I just look for, for clarity. And so, um, sometimes if there isn't, um, a budget form that's provided by the, the agency, if people put things, lay things out in bullet points in really clear ways, that is really helpful. Um, I am not a fan of multiple pages, multiple pages of budget. I just feel like that adds a lot of confusion. And sometimes I feel like when I see that, I feel like um, I, I worry that like there are folks who are like individuals or small organizations who just don't have the time and the capacity to, you know, run their budget through a bunch of software or whatever. And so, um, and so I try not to, I try to just focus on the clarity of it versus like the, the, the quantity or, or whatever, or, or um, that, you know, I just like to know if it, I like to come away with no questions or confusion. Just want to pop back in and then I'll pass it to you, Nat. Um, something that I had heard before I had had written a main arts commission grant from staff is that, um, you know, it's generally very favorable for you to be as an artist or as an organization paying paying other artists, you know, and um, and like spreading the wealth and there's, it's not like that's that's a policy somewhere, but I think that was kind of being shared from the perspective of like, this resonates with reviewers and it resonates with that feeling of like, 
you know, rep, um, recycling that wealth and spreading it. And so I would, I would, I wouldn't um, like invent elements to hire other artists if that's not the nature of the work you're doing. But if there is something that's naturally collaborative, you know, I'm thinking about like, I got some funding for a record that I put out and the cover art was done by a main artist and the graphic design was done by a main artist. And, you know, I think that those types of elements helped strengthen where it's like, I need all this money, but I really just need it so I can give it to other people so that I can get a amazing product. Yeah, I think I was going to add two things quick. Um, earlier, Sarah said something about aligning the the narrative with the budget, and I and I really believe that budgeting is storytelling, right? If you if it's in the budget, it's another chance to lift up the fact that a thing is happening, and it's also a it's a values proposition, right? So when you put a thing in your budget, it shows that it's important to the project and that it's happening, and that's where talking about in-kind services can be really beneficial as a way of uplifting the fact that a thing is happening, right? So Sarah uh, might be able to pay the artist for her cover art, or she might not, right? But the fact is she needs the cover art. So um, putting the fact, putting, putting the event of cover art value in the budget lets you know that she's thought about that, right? And then she's made a decision whether she can there's, there's cash available for that or what maybe she's trading for it or something else. Um, the other thing I was going to say is um, I'm personally, I'm kind of over the, um, the pride, prideful volunteerism. Like we, we, we hear a lot of people say, oh, I'm not going to pay myself or I'm not in it for the money. And I, I want us to stop talking about those things. We just need to value each other's time. And it's okay to put a line in for the time that you are spending um, working on the project. And um, if, if funders, you know, have a hard time with that, then we need to work on them, not on how you are planning to do your work. That's, that's my little soapbox. Thanks. <laughs> so there's a question that we have and Sima, maybe you can start off on this one. Because I've heard I've heard people answer this differently. Um, we uh, we want to know how their work is benefiting the public. That that means organizations as well as individual artists, um, even artists who are doing a record or you know finishing some painting series or something like that. Um, how would you how would what would you like to see people say in that with that answer? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I think all of those things are sometimes hard to capture because there's just not, there's often not enough, often not enough, enough space. And so I think, I think, um, um, and I think that there is always the, it's all, you know, these applications are aspirational. And um, so I, I, as I said in the beginning, I really like applications that 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 demonstrate that there is some sort of understanding or acknowledgement that of the community that it hopes to benefit. And I feel like I feel like if that is actually true and there, then you know, then that easily comes through in that in that narrative piece. Um, you know, so if if there's no actual, if the artist or the organization is actually not connected to the community that they're in, then there's just, then it just feels, um, it just does not feel as honest or as earnest. And so I just, I, I think that it, so, you know, I think using that space to talk about the, um, the collaborations, if there were collaborations that led to the led to the project or that that were you know or the um or the the future collaborations that folks are hoping will come out of the project um i think that that highlighting those things uh are really use are really useful 
I think that sometimes that part gets really can get really bogged down in context. I know that when I'm writing grants, I always feel like I have to, there's so much that I have to be able to explain because I'm explaining all of this important information to folks who don't have, um, who aren't as rooted in the work that, that I'm, you know, as I'm rooting, rooted in the work. And so, um, so I know that it can get to be a bit tricky, but just focusing on, I think just focusing, narrowing in on, on um, um, the relationship that that project has or the person, the artist, the, organiza the organization has to the, to the public and to the community, that always works for me. Sarah or Nat, do you have anything you wanna add there? Yeah, I'll, I'll say that, you know, one, one thing that's great about um, being an artist or working in an arts organization and applying to your state arts commission is that uh, hopefully you don't have to define the inherent value of working in the arts. Like it's, this is, a, we're in a system where that's, we're all, that's what we do. And, and the, the reviewers understand that already. And I think um, Samat touched on the fact that what, what you should do is talk about um, who you're working with and what community you're working in and how you are thoughtful about them, right? And it's, it's um, we wanna support creation for sure, but creation on its own without sharing um, maybe isn't inherently valuable or maybe isn't what grant making um, is meant to support. And so there are a lot of good ways to think about what you're doing and how you're delivering it and what, what the experience you want to create is for your audience. And so I think to me, that's the, that's the question about um, community value, not necessarily that you know, music uh, or dancing makes people healthier or whatever. That's, that's not the interesting end of the conversation. And just a little bit to add, I think that um, being honest about the knowns and the unknowns, you know, um, just like, what are the limitations? Like, we don't sometimes know the impact on our audience, or we can aspire to, this is part, I think this is part of the greater conversation or among main watercolor painters or something, um, you know, I, I think making that case at the right scale, like not overselling it, like kind of because it will be noticed, but being able to just, um, you know, uh, share what the, what the goal and the dream is about it. And of course, if there are on the ground, needs have been identified, partners have been identified, but also the places where there's gaps, it's like, um, it's a pretty understanding and human review process and, that's at you know that's going to be respected if you you're not quite sure about one piece. I just have one more thing to say about that. It's it's um it's easier to get on board when the applicant is specific about who they're working with, and when when I think when folks say they're doing a thing that's for everyone or everyone's invited, and they're not acknowledging that. Um, the, the world of art making and art sharing is, uh, you know, really um, fraught with different kinds of privilege and access. And we might aspire to reach everyone, but often we don't. And, and, and many times we're not actually trying to reach everyone. And that, that can be okay. Um, you can be specific about who you're trying to work with, but you need to own who you're trying to work with and then communicate that when you're, when you're finding support. Yeah, I just want to emphasize, like, I think that um, when I read a grant application where it seems clear that the that the the collaborations actually aren't there, again, maybe they're aspirational, I don't know, but um, I always come away from that with the question, who asked for this or who needed this or who, and that is the like most awful feeling to come away from a grant application, you know, and I think especially at this moment where um, people want to 
people are trying to engage with that with a wide range of audiences with whatever their project is, right? And I I just feel like I, I am more excited to read about um, like details about like the beginning of a conversation or a collaboration um, than I am to read about like you know, yeah, it's going to reach all these people without, you know, without any actual, like, well, who are the people that you've talked to? Who are the people that you're actually going to, that you've actually been, been working with? I just really, have, it just makes my stomach sink when I come away from an application going, I, I am not sure that this is the, the folks that this project is hoping to impact, that there's any connection with those folks. Great. Uh, David Greenham, I think, um, has been collecting questions. I, I have. Thank you so much. Thank you all for these these great uh, this great conversation there. I have a, a few questions, but but several of them uh, come back to this idea of of community engagement and and, um, you know, we just we just sort of talked about about the collaborators and and also the the ambition of who you're going to reach. Uh, but there's some questions of how how do you know how when you're reading an application, how do you know it when you see it? How do you how do you really feel it? And it, and and I think, Sama, you you just mentioned there's a sense of 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 disappointment or letdown when you read a grant. When is there a when is there a a uh, uh, a moment of of excitement or or the you know what makes you excited about about those kind of collaborations or those kind of community engagements. Yeah, one of the ways that I know it when I see it is if if you know I, if there's direct conver conversation about it, like if it's like a um, or if it's if it's um, beyond just like listing the people who are the collaborators, right? If there's some direct conversation about what they're going to be doing, that kind of thing. Um, also, if they are engaged from the beginning, um, in the in the inception of the project or working alongside that for me feels like true collaboration. Um, and what feels more aspirational is, you know, um, if it's very vague, if it's, you know, we're gonna be doing outreach in this community, whatever, name the X community. That to me is like, well, that you, you, the, you haven't start, that, that hasn't started yet um who who are the folks that you, you might have to figure out who the people that you're going to do outreach with or you know you know, you haven't started any of that work yet so um if it's direct and if it's collaborative from the inception those two things and i think something that um Sama, you had said earlier about like the beginnings of conversations knowing those details kind of helps to like if it is a new collaboration, understanding why it's a new collaboration and how that got sparked. And in the case of something where there's an ongoing collaboration or ongoing community engagement, you can kind of see in the history of, hey, these two organizations were intersecting before. Hey, there's a track record of they put on XYZ events, you know, together in the past couple of years. And so that some of that stuff either would come up naturally in the narrative if you're telling the story of your success um, or if it exists you should definitely put it in your narrative because it helps to just like demonstrate what is like authentically working and and why why that's unfolding there's there's so many different levels at which to interrogate this question and i think um, it's hard to talk about all of them but i think so I have a lot of different answers. You know, there you might be an organization that brings um, programs that's 
you know, fairly specific from a curatorial prerogative or a, or a programming prerogative, and you've decided it's kind of firm, right? And it's not based on what the community has asked you to do, but even then you could do some work around thinking about how to, how to not just uh, invite people and then see if they show up, but like, you know, try to maybe, maybe you, you're working in a discipline that's not uh, popular, right? But you believe in its, its value. And so you have work to do with relationships in your community about teaching people about that thing and inviting them in with some relationships behind the invitation, right? Or perhaps you're in a group of people that just wants some activity to happen in your community. And I, I think when I'm reviewing, I'm looking at, well, who are those people that decided and how do they invite uh, other folks to speak up about what they want, right? Like if, you, if you're running a, a community music series, for example, um, do, do people in your community get to say what kind of music they're interested in ever, right? Or, or is it just the same people making the same decision over and over again? And um, again, you know, there, it's not necessarily that that's totally right or totally wrong, but um, it's easier when you're grant making to be excited about more voices, more perspectives, more people having a say over more people having the experience. Great. Thank it's you. about awareness, I think. Yeah. Um, I'm, as you know, the Arts Commission awards uh, individual uh, artist uh, grants as well. And I'm going to uh, pull together a couple of, of thoughts uh, around that uh, from Erica Ball and uh, Karen Spitfire. And the, and the question is, as, as reviewers, you, you, it's certainly impossible for you to know every art form and every trend and and so, you know, and have complete fluency of every everything. How, how much should the applicant expect or how should the applicant expect that a reviewer who who maybe doesn't know as much about that art form, um, that specific art form, uh, how, how much should they put? How much explanation? Where do you find that level between somebody treating you like you know nothing or treat and or treating you like you're an expert in you know whatever and caustic art and then and then to to add in the question of of how do we how does an individual artist go about showing their community engagement somehow or you want to, I saw you nodding your head. Yeah, well, those are two very different questions. So I, I um, so I'll start with the, the first question, like I was going and then it took a turn and I was like, oh, I can't, I can't cobble my answer together there. Um, Sorry about so, that. That's okay. Um, and I might ask you to repeat the second question. Um, so, you know, again, going back to one of the, for me, going back to what we first started our conversation with in terms of the supplemental materials that's like in reviewing uh main arts commission grants that that is where i found that i did the the expected to find to do some you know to educate myself not necessarily in the in the grant proposal in the grant um in the narrative um but also i think um that's the beauty of having the review conversations because I come to each of them knowing that I may not necessarily, you know, I've got the supplemental materials that have helped me, that have helped provide a little bit of grounding, um, a little bit of context, but I think through the conversation, I might have a better, you know, I always come up, came away with it with a, with a better sense of the, the, the bigger picture of whatever, whatever the the artistic form was. So I I really valued the conversations and the supplemental materials. Sarah, you were. Yeah, I'll just pop right. in on that one. On that one, because I also can only think of one question at a time. But I think that, um, like, 
you can assume the reviewers are folks that respect that your art is being created and that it has some value because it's a creation that you believe in and it's going to be respected on that level. That said, if there are some details about how um, the benefits of this particular arts education program in, you know, in the community and the school system is reporting that XYZ results are coming, it's like, please educate me on that. I don't know about that. And, um, you know, just the ability to tell that story really compellingly um, is going to strengthen this application and, and every other application that you make. So I don't think, um, I don't think that you need to worry about potentially talking down to, to your, uh, the grant reviewers. I think if you tell them something they already know, it's okay. <laughs> like, it'll be okay. It's the important thing is for you to be as clear as you can be. If it includes um, sharing something that you think somebody else may already know, that's to me, that's okay. Nat, got anything to add? So you want to say that second question again, David? No, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, but uh, <laughs> but the, how does an individual, do you have any hints or any suggestions on how an individual artist could show reviewers about impact of art that, that you know, they're creating for the first time and hasn't, hasn't existed. Nat, you want to start? So, um, so I'm, uh, it's been a while since I've reviewed individual artist grants for the Arts Commission, and I'm not, I'm not sure how this, what the, what the phrasing of this particular question might be. Um, but I'm going to guess if it's a if it's a project grant that's about being supported so that you can share your work is is that kind of what we're getting at that you need to think about what is what do you want someone's experience to be when they're intersecting with whatever it is you do right and I think that's a that's a thing some artists don't want to think about to be honest they just want to make right and I think. I think artists who are successful in getting support uh, do take a minute and think about that question and and are have a conscientiousness about what the intersection, how the intersection works and and what it means for somebody. And you know, I I as in my past curatorial uh, experience, I've worked with people who wanted to make things and didn't want to take any responsibility for what audience response might be. And then, uh, and to me, that's not an interesting way to work, right? I, I want them to be, I want the artist to think through what happens at that point of intersection, right? So if it's a performance, um, do you have an idea about how you want your audience to feel, right? Or do you, you know, are you going for a, a joyful experience? Are you, are you going to make it, is it contemplative? Do you want to make them think about a thing? Do you want them to take action politically after you're done? You know, again, there's no one, I don't think there's a better answer or worse answer. What we're looking for when we're reading your application is, have you thought about it? And are you clear with yourself about those intentions? And if you're not yet, it's going to be hard for you to uh, meet those goals, I think. Sarah or Samaya, anything to add? Not substantially. I think a clear intention, if, if you don't have a history of engaging community, really being clear on what the intention is and what the plan is, and, um, and also a demonstration of why you think that that plan would work. Like, some other organization has done this kind of event. Some other artist was, you know, successful with this and there was people wanted more or wanted different and I'm going to provide something different. Oh, thank you so right, much. David. And I, I will, I will just say to conclude as we get to the end here is, the, is just uh, in the chat many, many times were, were thank you for that answer or thank you for you know, having your different point of view and, and you know, all, all of those things as well. Um, so we clearly everybody really appreciates 
just simply having the conversation. There are more questions that that we didn't get to, and um, we will we will figure out a way to answer those uh, in an email uh, next week. We'll talk about that. But but there's there were a lot of wonderful questions tonight. So thank you all. So no one my last question. I have one last question for you then. Somebody wanted to know if they could, for in kind, can they list their mother or other relatives as in kind if they give them money or they um, help in the project? If people give you money, that's not in kind, that's a cash donation. Mm -hmm. If your mother comes and uh, materially contributes to the production of what you're doing and you don't pay her for her services, that's in-kind labor. Was that, I, like, was that a trick? <laughs> no, this is a real question. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> I love that somebody wanted to know how to use, put their mother into the, into the budget. I love that someone wanted to include their mother in the budget. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, we are we are wrapping up. There are, as David said, there's more questions, and we will do our best to answer them um, in emails or direct you to resources that um, we have in our our um, our other webinars or the um, help page, the grants help page, and we have an exit survey that I really. Um, want folks to do on their way out. Are you putting that in, David? Great, thank you. And I wanna appreciate um, our panelists, Saman, Nat, and Sarah for sharing your thoughts and sort of bouncing things around together. I know we could go on for a whole nother hour at least. Um, and to thank all the participants for your thoughtful questions and um, really engaging in your good attention. Um, this has been a great um, maybe first, first action. I know um, we have many people in, interested in this who weren't even parts of arts organizations. I think this has obviously hit a nerve in the, in the main um, grant seeking zeitgeist. And uh, I hope that other foundations or the whole um, cohort of foundations sort of figure out how to keep offering this kind of opportunity. Um, I just wanted to make sure that I've gotten everything. We got the exit survey, the webinars with the registration link is in there. Okay, I think we're good to go. Any last words from our, from our wonderful panel? Songwriting wisdom is also applicable for grant writing and it's say it true, say it plain, keep it short. <laughs> <laughs> you kind of have to keep it short because there's a character limit, which we did increase this year, just so you know, just so people know. We increased our character limits a little bit. Sama or Nat, any last words? I was just gonna say that um, the Arts Commission has been a huge asset for me in learning about grant writing, um, at, at being a grant writer. Um, I was invited to be a reviewer early on in my career as a grant writer, and it really um, helped me learn a lot. And there, you know, Martha mentioned ways to volunteer to be a reviewer for the Arts Commission. There are other community opportunities out in the world where you can be a reviewer, and it, it just it helps you think differently about what, what it means to be communicating this way. So I would encourage you. And then the other thing I just wanted to say is I've never heard of anyone figuring this stuff out by themselves. It, you know, you always need help. You, it's, you, you have to ask people for help along the way and don't be shy about that. Yes, we are absolutely, I'm, we are all, all staff here at the Maine Arts Commission are happy to help people think through proposals, look at proposals, um, help you dissect them afterwards <laughs> when you didn't get funding. Um, we're absolutely here to help with that. Sama? 
Yeah, I don't, I don't think I have. Well, I think um, I would encourage folks to sign up to be a reviewer. I feel like it just, it really, um, it, you know, helps you and, and in the end, it helps you and be a better grant writer. But also, even if you're, even if you've been a reviewer for other funders, all of the, all of the processes are a little bit different. And so um, it's really fascinating. It has been fascinating for me to review Maine Arts Commission grants because it's totally different from the other, you know, from Maine Community Foundation, from Maine Initiatives, all those kinds of things, um, all those kinds of funders. And, um, and, um, and it's really wonderful to have the opportunity to hear from you, know, you, you reading the grants is a very like a it's a very isolating process and then you come out of that and you have these conversations with a group of folks who also were like isolated reading the grants and it's just it's a really um you just have lovely conversations and so i would encourage folks um to participate great that's a great last word <laughs> um thank you so much to everyone um go forth, write some awesome grant proposals, and um, hopefully they'll get funded. <laughs>